Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Who do you think was the best admiral of World War II? Believe it or not, in 1942, the Navy made their list of who they thought would be their most successful admirals during the war. Back in 2011, this secret list was found, and I just got a hold of a very interesting article it's been out for 12 years, but I just saw it, and it's one of my favorite things I've read in a long time. This article is by Richard B. Frank, who's an author for the U.S. Naval Institute, and this, was, uh, this article was first published in May 2011 in Naval History Magazine. It's called Picking Winners. The story here is that uh, Roosevelt was absolutely furious with the Navy for the constant string of defeats early in World War II. So in February of 1942, he told Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox to come up with a list of the 40 best admirals in the Navy. So at this time, there were 120 admirals, and that includes some of the captains who had been selected to be promoted to admirals, but they weren't quite admirals yet. Uh, they're, they're included here as well. Uh, so there are 120 admirals. He said, who are the 40 that are going to perform the best? Uh, Presumably so, he could start relieving people from command and replacing them with higher ranking admirals. As far as we know, uh, this was a very secret document. I'm not aware of any promotions that were uh, performed because of someone's merit on this list. So at the end of the day, it's just a really interesting list of who the Navy thought at the beginning of World War II were going to be the top performers and whether they were or weren't. And as the author points out, the really interesting thing about the list are the people who don't make it. We're going to go over that in a second, but first, here's a word from our sponsors. The strain of command often cost battleship admirals a lot of weight. Admiral William F. Halsey on New Jersey famously lost close to 100 pounds, dropping from about uh, 240 pounds to just 150 pounds by the end of World War II. Part of this, because of how active the ship was in her combat operations, Admiral Halsey wasn't able to get food all the time. So that's why things like magic spoons are great for being able to eat on the go when you're busy, like Admiral of the Fleet or a museum ship curator trying to get their ship ready for dry dock. Magic Spoon's new treats are the perfect high-protein snack for on-the-go. It's the same magic you know and love, but in a convenient, travel-friendly package. The treats come in two delicious flavors, marshmallow and chocolatey peanut butter. They're just like the chewy, sweet, nostalgic treats you remember as a kid, but all grown up. Each treat has 11 grams of protein, just one gram of sugar, one to two net carbs, and is only 130 calories. They're perfect for pre or post workout fuel, snacking anytime, a kid's school lunch, or satisfying your sweet tooth. Click the link below to try Magic Spoon's new treats today and be sure to check out both delicious protein packed flavors marshmallow and chocolatey peanut butter. My favorite is the peanut butter. Whether you like sticking to the classics or trying something new, there's a flavor you'll love. And just like with their cereal, Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Click the link below or scan the QR code on the screen and use the code BATTLESHIP for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com battleship to save $5 off your order today. And don't forget to add the marshmallow and chocolatey peanut butter treats to your order. Also, for my Canadian and British fans, Magic Spoon also ships to Canada and the United Kingdom. So before I continue any further, there's a link uh, to the website for Naval Institute where you can read this article yourself. It, it is a fantastic read, uh, some really interesting information. I uh, was only aware of about a third of these admirals. Some of them don't even show up in Samuel Ellison Morrison's um, History of the U.S. Navy, which is a 15-volume work if you haven't had the chance to read that yet. Uh, so. It's really interesting uh, reading about some of the folks who are on this list, as well as uh, thinking about some of the famous admirals you know of from World War II who don't make the list. 
I'm going to go through this uh, and talk about some of these admirals. The, um, my opinions are just that. They do not belong to the museum. They're not necessarily the opinion represented by the author. I do recommend you, you read his original words in addition to watching this video. Uh, at the end of the day, all of the gentlemen on this list served their countries for 20 years or more, which is something I have not done, and uh, served during World War II, which again, I, I cannot compete with them for that. Uh, however, they, they have mixed records, and uh, please don't lambast me too badly for bringing up my opinions of some of them. So, from the Admiral's Cabin on Battleship, New Jersey, here is the list of the top 40 admirals in the U.S. Navy. First of all, Knox orders the Navy to do this secret study. How does the Navy do this? They choose to put together an ad hoc committee of nine members to look at uh, the process similar to a selection board. So they go through each of the 120 names and they vote on it. Uh, it's a popularity contest. The, the very best ones will be voted thumbs up by all nine members of the committee. If you do not get a thumbs up from at least five members of the committee, you do not make the list. So uh, those are the names that we're looking at right here. The committee is formed uh, by five admirals who had served as commander-in-chief uh, of one of the major fleets, the U.S. fleet, the Pacific fleet, the Asiatic fleet, uh, one of the major fleets. So those are uh, admirals Richardson, Kalbfus, Yarnall, Block, and Reeves. So these five guys show up all the time in the history of the interwar Navy. Uh, they're, they're some of the giants of the 20s and 30s. They're still in the Navy at this point, uh, so they are voting on the list. And because they have already held major fleet commands and then gone on to other uh, basically pre-retirement positions, none of them show up on this list. The current uh, commanders in chief Admiral Ernest J. King, who's CNC U.S. Fleet, and uh, Admiral Harold Stark, who's Chief of Naval Operations, immediately get put on the list, uh, one assumes with nine votes. So only 38 slots left at this point. The other two members were Rear Admiral Richard S. Edwards and Randall Jacobs. Edwards was the Chief of Staff uh, for Operations, King's deputy. And uh, Jacobs was the head of Navy personnel. He took over that position when Nimitz took over Pacific Fleet. So it makes sense that, that these two guys uh, would also be in the selection process. Uh, they also received enough votes to make it on this list. Five other officers received nine votes. Admirals Jonas Ingram, Richard Edwards, who just mentioned, John Hoover, William Purnell, and Arthur Bristol. It's interesting uh, because I'm not too familiar with the works of any of these five admirals. And in the article, make sure you go and read the article, it gives at least a sentence description of the, their wartime service. Many of them serve in, in various logistical roles, behind the scenes roles, not necessarily in frontline fleet command positions. With eight votes, there were six people selected. And the author argues, and I have to agree uh, that these were probably some of the worst choices by the selection board. About one-third of the officers on this list do really great work during World War II. Uh, and arguably only one of them is on this list with eight votes. Uh, so first off, Admiral William F. Halsey. He's going to go on to attain five-star rank. He's one of the admirals on this list that actually commands from Battleship, New Jersey. Um, he is really, really well thought of in his own time during World War II and immediately post-World War II. But nowadays, historians have been looking at his career from a more critical eye. Regardless, he was the one selected at that time to command a major fleet in the major naval theater of the war. Uh, it, so it is interesting to see that he was well thought of at that time. Uh, and perhaps that impacts his career and his selections for various positions. The kind of middle of the tier ones with eight votes, Charles Cook and William Glassford, another pair of folks that uh, don't receive much recognition for the World War II service. But uh, they did not have negative performances such as the other folks on this list. Admirals Robert Gormley, 
Robert Giffen, and Charles Pownell. All three of them uh, end up relieved of command at various points in the war, which I should mention, uh, World War II was not fought the way modern wars are fought. And in many ways, we, we fought it better, which is probably why we were more successful in that war than some of our modern ones. Uh, in the modern Navy, you tend to give in a command for a set period of time. So if you're not performing at that command, you're not removed from command, you're just left there to finish out your time. It's very rare in the post-World War II uh, and really post-Korean War Navy uh, to remove an officer from a command. During World War II, if you're given a command and you're not performing well, or if your allies don't like you, other officers don't like you, you'd be removed from command and that didn't end your career like being removed from command today is. It means that uh, you get shuffled up to a different position often a position that you can perform better in. And oftentimes these guys who are put in these other positions uh, make new experiences. They're often given a second chance in a major command and they often perform better. Uh, so while I'm talking about folks who are removed from command here because they don't perform well in one campaign or another, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were bad officers or it was the end of their career. It, it does tend to mean though that uh, historians give them a bad rap nowadays. So the eight votes are kind of rough. Seven votes are a little bit better. For example, you have Royal Ingersoll, who was the commander of the Atlantic fleet. He was a fantastic commander. In fact, King himself lists Ingersoll as second only to Spruance during the war. Uh, unfortunately, today he's not well known because the Atlantic was, was such a uh, more limited naval theater than the Pacific. Also on this list are Admirals Aubrey Fitch and Mark Mitcher, who were uh, great carrier admirals during the war. And uh, Mitcher is a great example. On this list, he's still a captain about to be promoted to admiral. Uh, and in that time, he's going to command Hornet during the Battle of Midway. And let's face it, it was a lackluster command. So he gets shuffled around afterwards, but he's given a second chance and he's put back in charge of aircraft carriers later in the war and he becomes one of the premier aircraft commanders of World War II. So a perfect example of uh, moving people around, getting them more experience, and then putting them back in that role and, and seeing if they perform better. Uh, other folks in the seven vote list, Patrick Bellinger, uh, Frank Fletcher, who would command uh, during the major carrier battles like Coral Sea and Midway, Richmond Kelly Turner, and Olaf Hustved. So the, these admirals are pretty well thought of. Uh, Fletcher, believe it or not, got a bad rap in his own time for his conduct of carrier operations early in World War II, primarily because he was not an aviator himself. And so he gets sent to Alaska and uh, actual aviators like Halsey get put in charge of the carrier groups. Modern historians tend to look much more favorably on Fletcher and his ability to preserve the assets he had so that the US Navy was able to continue to fight. Uh, Richmond Kelly Turner goes the opposite direction. He was pretty well thought of in his own time. I have never thought particularly highly of him, and most uh, modern historians have gone back and, and uh, given him a much more negative rep. He um, is widely considered the best amphibious forces commander of World War II, and I just don't think that's true. Uh, Olaf Hostved was actually the reason why I found this. Um, we, we were looking at some historic documents from the ship, that related to a sailor's death on board in an accident. An investigation was ordered into that death by the commander of Battleship Division 7. I assumed that uh, the commander of Battleship Division 7 was Oscar Badger, who is also on this list and will command Battleship Division 7 later in the war. But in 44, it was not him, and I didn't know who it was off the top of my head. Uh, so I looked it up and was Olaf Hostved, and in his Wikipedia page entry, the last paragraph says something absolutely wild, like uh, he is not generally well known today uh, because aircraft took over the role of battleships, uh, but he is well known for being a, a tremendous battleship admiral. I'm like, well, that's a bold statement. Who says that? It's a so uh, the source was actually cited because it's a Wikipedia article. So I clicked on it and it sent me to this article, which said, had battleships dominated the naval war, 
Rear Admiral Olaf Hustved might have shined as a major successful leader. When the battleship entered an eclipse, so did his promising career. So that, that was a, a really interesting thing to read and something that shows up in a Wikipedia article. And that, that's how I found this great article here. Uh, next up, we have six vote candidates. There were nine officers who got this. Admiral Herbert Leary, Arthur Carpenter, Russell Wilson, Roland Brainard, John S. McCain, William S. Farber, William W. Smith, Jesse B. Oldendorf, and Robert Griffin. So th this is another uh, mix of people. You might, uh, you might uh, recognize folks like Oldendorf, who commanded the battleships during Suragawa Strait, and uh, John S. McCain, who commanded aircraft carriers under Admiral Halsey. The absolutely most scathing thing written in here about an admiral. Uh, William S. Farber got no reviews at all. He was so obscure that his name does not even appear. Samuel Elliott Morrison's massive 15-volume history of the U.S. naval operations in World War II. Uh, so, so this is a, a list with some people you've heard of, uh, some mixed reviews. McCain uh, does really well with land-based air later in the war. Uh, the war really takes a physical toll on him, and in fact, he'll, he'll die uh, at the end of the war because of medical conditions. Um, but his performance later in the war is often criticized right alongside Halsey's. Finally, we have the last 11 who got five votes each. John Wilcox, Randall Jacobs, Bernard Berry, Milo Dremel, William Monroe, Willis Lee, Oscar Badger, Walden Ainsworth, those last three were all battleship admirals, of course, Lee well known, uh, Robert Theobald, Daniel Callahan, and Alan Kirk. Uh, so again, kind of a mixed review, folks you've never heard of, people like Willis Lee, who, who performed tremendously during World War II, uh, despite being hampered by being a battleship expert. Uh, folks like Dan Callahan, who is semi-successful. Uh, recent historians have criticized his leadership but he did manage a successful naval engagement in which he was killed, so it's hard for me to criticize him. And the article wraps up by uh, summing up some of the, the fun facts about these people as a group of individuals. So for example, all of them graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy. None of the folks who came up through the Hall's pipes or came from an officer candidate program or, or any other uh, means were selected. Again, this is a popularity contest, and that's why only one third of them were actually successful. Uh, another interesting stat, one quarter of them, 10, were aviators, which is really interesting given that this is the age of battleships. Many of those aviators had also served on battleships and uh, were very interested in battleships. For example, Halsey trying to drive his battleships into gun range during a carrier battle. Uh, however, that's a really interesting statistic. Only five of them had their submarine dolphins. Five of them were also incredibly accomplished marksmen. However, by far, the most striking absent, or the most striking thing about this list is the absences. Nimitz is not on it. Spruance is not on it. The author argues that that's probably because Nimitz was just placed in command. He had been jumped above several other people because he was a favorite of Roosevelt. That certainly did not make him a favorite of the folks on the selection board. And in February and early March of 1942, when this list is being put together, he hadn't performed yet. The, the Battle of Coral Sea won't be till April. The Battle of Midway, where he really proves himself as a leader, won't be until June, several months later. Uh, and, and Nimitz himself, in his own journal during this time period, is talking about how people are upset that he hasn't produced. And we see that Roosevelt is upset that the Navy hasn't produced in general, which is why he wants this list of admirals made in the first place. Likewise, Spruance is, is a relatively low-level cruiser commander. He's not in the battleship gun club, he's not a carrier admiral, and, and he hasn't had the chance to perform. He serves alongside Halsey, who is well thought of and on this list, uh, and, and so that really makes him obscure until Halsey himself nominates him to take over at the Battle of Midway, where he really shows his abilities, and that, that jumpstarts his career. So, who is your favorite Admiral of World War II? 
let us know in the comment section down below. What are some interesting things you saw in this article? Be sure to click on the link down below and check it out and let us know what, what were some of the interesting features you saw in there. What were some of the uh, most scathing reviews that the author gave of these admirals? And which ones do you think were under-recognized or could have been greater had they been selected for promotion? Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate your support. There's a link in the description below if you'd like to donate to support the museum and our channel. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about the museum. Thanks for watching.